Well, as we're sitting here on this beautiful afternoon of Thursday, October 19th, year 2000 and something 23, here with the Hello Hello Show. My name is Chaim Mizrahi, continuing with the tradition of public access and the tradition of the Hello Hello Show that's been on the air since 1980. Of course, not to fail to mention the contribution by Fraser Dougherty, Francis Ann, and a huge group of people like yourselves directly and indirectly, knowingly and unknowingly, contributing to the enhancement and um, ex expansion uh, of that concept called public access and LTV in particular. We're sitting here with uh, Steve Rum, my friend Steve Rum. Thank you, first of all, first and foremost, that you uh, allow us to enjoy your presence. And I don't say it with uh, any degree of irony. And also, in addition to that, to, to know that every time we have a gathering like this, we uh, it stretches beyond just uh, uh, the on all the levels possible that we interact. The learning curve keeps Each going Each level up. picks up a, a, an independent uh, meaning. Yep. Um, and it shows, listen, you know, you can paint one painting a year and I can paint a hundred. And we'll still find Even. out that we put the same <laughs> amount same of amount effort. Of effort. A life of same amount of effort, same I amount of I creativity. I, I wanted to say I love you for this kind of uh, instincts to come and say almost like the same thing at the same time that I want to say. And your uh, listening public and watching public should know that you've now been blessed with a magical easel that is going to transform everything you paint on it because it has an, if you, at late at night, usually on a, windy rainy night if you turn off the lights in your studio you will see this blue aura around the <coughs> easel and it just sort of glows and um, it will give you inspiration beyond your already extraordinary form of uh, inspiration that you have yeah and uh, in, in addition to that there's just a uh, actually I think we can do this yeah that's good uh, and um, it's important to have someone in your life that can understand the nuance and the ins and outs of spending time in a studio. Having a studio to begin with and spending time and then spending a meaningful time and then ending up with the results, no matter what kind of results, but most likely uh, results that will satisfy us. I mean, I, I, I'm sure, I'm guessing now, um, that when you went to your studio in the past, in the past years and all that, most of the time you came out of the studio pretty happy about what just took place. Um, if at all you got out of there. Yeah, um, well, that was the main thing. The problem is that, uh, as <laughs> you know, when you go into the studio, you usually go, oh, I'm just going to do a couple of brush strokes and I'll be in there for 10 minutes. I'll be right there, honey, for dinner. And the next morning, um, <laughs> as the night goes by, and you have no sense of time whatsoever, and suddenly you realize uh, it's 9 o'clock the next day, and you're not tired. You're refreshed. Yes, you leave the studio feeling a sense of accomplishment, or depending upon how you're painting, a sense of frustration that you've got to go back into the studio as soon as possible and fix what you screwed up or whatever, whatever transpired in there in those moments of um, creativity doesn't always go the way you want it to, but that's the challenge and that's the joy of painting or sculpting or any art form um, is that you're doing something. I just read something really interesting today. Um, they're not allowed to take uh, any pieces anymore from any of the master's artwork, the Mona Lisa or Rembrandt's paintings or anything like that, but they can now scan through the paint and they found that um, the Mona Lisa was painted on wood, and uh, the backing on the wood was white lead paint, which I can relate to because that's what I used on all of my earlier paintings. But there was also another chemical that they found mixed in with the white lead paint, which da Vinci apparently invented because he was a scientist on top of being an artist. An inventor, yeah. A um, major inventor. And... What it basically is is what we call Japanese dryer, so that he didn't have to wait the three or four weeks for the white lead paint, which he had to put on heavily because it was on wood. Also texture. And it was the texture. It was the background texture. Um, whether he wanted it smooth or, or texture, whatever it was, but there was something mixed in. 
and they now credit him with adding this other chemical to the white lead paint um, that nobody had ever seen before. And apparently the one that picked up on it was Rembrandt, and about 19 other artists started doing the same thing to make their backgrounds dry a little faster. And I remember when I did it, of course, none of us knew how dangerous white lead paint was. Oh, yeah. Uh, we would do 10 canvases at a time, let it dry, sand it, no mask, put another coat of white lead paint on, sand it, no mask, breathe all this stuff in. No wonder you look like the way you look you know, today. <laughs> I figure I should have been dead, but the white lead paint has preserved Forget every organ that. in my body. I mean, uh, yeah. And you're talking to a person that in the uh, in the eighties used to, you know the, the the use of um, bleaching oil here in the East End was almost as if you were to say today the acrylic uh, solid stain, you know, right. straight from. But you know, with our snake poison and that oh. bleaching, you know what we used to do? We used to spray it on the sidings, right, and take a broom <laughs> <laughs> and and spread it like because it called for it. You have really needed something rough right. to force the sealer. Supposedly, what sealer? What nonsense! It was poison, literally, and it would get on our hair, on our pants, whatever. Well, nobody wore gloves <coughs> or masks when I used to print. And in then the years early later, in the eighties, printing on a six-color Heidelberg press. There were 55-gallon drums of kerosene, <coughs> alcohol, because that's what they used to wash up the plates. And they were just open. So you'd walk into the uh, the printing place, and I loved the smell. You know, it, you get addicted to that smell. I don't know what the longevity of the printers were. Uh, the guys that ran the presses, probably 35 years. Everybody was young because they probably just dropped dead. But um, then they, they then uh, brought in soy-based inks. And they didn't need the uh, all the chemicals and everything anymore. But probably turns out that soy-based inks are probably more dangerous than the oil-based inks. But uh, it was an interesting time in printing, and you know, not every printer used the proper um, code or government standards for ventilation and bringing in fresh air yeah. and everything else. And also, uh, Jackson Pollock and the likes of him would faint if he was to live in our. Times where he, they, they probably can, couldn't you can do get the paintings any they color did. in the world, you can match any color in the world. You have paints and primers that are supreme. You can tint primers right. with pigments and make it look like paint, and it will take an expert, a super expert, on, on only to really realize that it's not paint. But besides the fact, then it's affordable. You know, Jackson Pollock used to always talk about the. Uh, he he was always thinking about that red color, red paint, a gallon of that red paint that costs there, then it costs to a hundred dollars. I can't imagine what it is today. Yeah, no, no, but I mean, it, today, hundred dollars from nineteen fifty to to today, it's probably a thousand dollars. Yeah, I was. But gonna today, say you can get uh, uh, something that's much better than that. Right. And forget about color. Whatever color yeah. that would be. It can be matched exactly in one second. Well, we had a PMS book, which was tints, <coughs> and it mixed the four but colors. But I'm you just going to complete. I'm just. I'm just going to complete what I wanted to say, and then you can talk about tints. So he would fantasize, and Lee Krasner. He couldn't wait for Lee to come and tell him, "Listen, we got the money for that gallon. Go get right. it." Right. And then when he gets it, remember in his autobiography, he writes when he was walking with that gallon thinking and fantasizing oh my god but already thinking that he would need one more and it's right. so expensive and it takes right he would faint if he was to be exposed to the reality of today and have so much available by way of signs by way of drying time by way of uh, uh, vi <coughs> vitality of color by way of reflection by way of finishes all the way from polyurethane to sealers to varnishes right. i mean you're talking about everything in your face but why I mentioned it is because I want to go back to the fact that when you paint, you paint. You need to paint. Look, even the <coughs> – you know, <coughs> I can buy Liquitex acrylic medium. I don't know what it costs today, but I can't use Liquitex acrylic medium. I have a special medium that I use. It comes in a gallon can. I think the last time I bought it, it was like $125 or $150. I'm sure, and I'm about to have to replace it, I'm sure – it's probably up to th between three hundred and five hundred dollars for a gallon. You need these hours in the studio in order to be reminded to sharpen your skills, to preserve them by doing so, 
And for example, yesterday I started, no, I didn't start. It was actually the early stages of 8 by 15. I mean, sorry, 4 by 15. 4 feet by 15 feet, casually on my frame uh, place of work. And it was the, the third application, actually fourth, because I did a background primer. I did black, I did white. And, and, I, came, and I came with the um, a, a blue hue, whatever it's called. What is it called? Blue, uh, the blue that, that, that's the closest to, the, to black possible. Right. Anyway, so I said to myself, usually I start from one side to the end, period, it, whether it's right or left, yeah? And usually I, I know that this is really overwhelming because what I want to do will take time. It's not like I'm doing f five circles and it's right. 15 feet. Um, so what I did, I didn't plan, but I realized, you know what, I have this, I grabbed, found a brush, and so I started wherever it was that I was standing. So I was standing like probably 25, one quarter away from the left corner. So I, I said, okay, I'll do this and I'll go to sleep. So I did that. I realized just, just being, this is goes to show you the power of revelation, accidental, so to speak. I realized that when I was starting from the corner, I was anticipating already how long it's going to take me. I don't feel like doing that. It's annoying me. I want to get to the bottom of it. I want to get to the stage where I can start really expressing because this is the process of deceiving the canvas and deterring the canvas from giving you a hard time later on. Right. Because uh, you want to show overwhelmed by s uh, things that will make it look like su superiority, you know? So I ended up doing the whole canvas. Because I know better not to look right and not to look left. I right. know better that I look to where this comfortable posture is dictating. So if it's this, then it's this. That's it. And when I looked at it, I realized because I can tell, you won't be able to tell, nobody will be able to tell. I can tell what was the difference in this application. So I'm like holding my breath when I do that and I realize that there's progress and I realize that I'm crazily happy. I hold my breath because I don't want to externalize that feeling, you know, because I feel if I show a feelings of uh, I'm so happy, I'm so satisfied that I'm realizing it, so much of my vital energy that we need for later on is coming out of me by doing that. It's like, what are you doing? Releasing all this energy into the thin air because you want to express that you're happy. I'm, I'm better off not to. Right. So I learned a huge lesson. And after that, when I was sitting and reflecting, I said, you know what? And God bless Steve Rowe, and I'm, I'm saying it for, for good reason, that you know, it's all about bringing capabilities, to, you know, your skills as a painter. And yes, your patience, and yes, your willingness to sit and put the hours. But it, you can you can be all of the above. But if you don't have what it takes, if you don't have the basic understanding of what it really means to be an artist, to be a painter, I can't. Then imagine. you're just beating about the bush. But uh, yeah. uh, th there's a protocol that you have to follow. And I say protocol with parentheses. You know, we just had an auction in our house, and we had wonderful people do it. I think the the company name is Auction Ninja, N I N J A. And we sold off a whole bunch of stuff. Um, they were there over a two-week period of time. And with everything that they sold, the house doesn't look any emptier. I mean, they sold, uh, they were page 20 items to a page, 20, 40, I don't know how many pages they had of stuff that they sold. And I go and I, I look in the area where they were working, and it looks the same. <coughs> I mean, we haven't put a dent into it yet. This is, and then there's a very interesting, and it relates to art. There's a, a very interesting, cathartic experience of parting with things that have you that you've had your entire life that you're getting rid of. And I think, uh, and I can't speak for other people, but uh, for Lenore and myself, whether you sell it or you give it or however you dispose of it. Parting with your past, it's like clearing up your past and making things simpler and easier to deal with. Um, you know, the, the first, the hardest things to deal with in life, first three things are losing a child, losing a spouse, moving. Those are the most stressful things that you can have. I think the fourth one after that is painting and dealing with the painting, and I'm being facetious about it, but 
you know as well as I do that when you do a painting, especially when you're doing a big painting, and it's not going the way you want it to go, and you're supposed to be the guy in charge of the painting, not the painting in charge of you. So that level of frustration that comes in and how you're controlling your paints and how you're um, getting your vision onto the canvas either leaves you frustrated at the end of the day or the night or the morning or feeling great that you've accomplished something, but there's an emotional impact one way or the other. And it's like, you know, the big landscape in the living room. Yes. Someday if I'm ever famous, somebody will take whatever they use to see what's underneath that cloud. They're gonna find seven other clouds under there. That painting was the most frustrating painting to do because I don't always control the process that I use for painting. It's really hard because you don't see anything until you're up to like 50 or 60 layers of glaze and the pigments. And then you look at it and you go, that's not what I want. And you do it again and you do it again and you do it again. Sometimes you get it the first time. What you're describing right now is, is something that I just about to, was, was about to express and share with you is that, you know, it's almost like that surface available in the early stages, it's like a wild animal, like like a uh, like a um, um, like a whatever kind of living creature with, with taming so many it, huh? Taming it. Yeah, but the thing is that it's just hands and legs everywhere, kind of trying right. to raise the surface, and you start with a with a wet sheet, and you put it on top of it, so it kind of muffles its uh, its movement, but it still moves. Then you take like a saran wrap, and you. And you and you fold and you go around and then you're doing a great job, but it's still breathing. You see that the belly and the thing up and down, and then you keep on wrapping it. You keep on introducing um, paint, but every time you do it, you're actually fine tuning your abilities to uh, execute and deliver it eventually when it's tamed and when you, the surface is all yours at your disposal. So now you're bringing all the reservoir of what it is that was accumulated and left over that you were smart enough to adapt into the later stages. So you, you're you talking about a painting, you know, it's cliche to say that the surface is moody uh, or moving or making sounds, but it is invisible at the same time. And, and it's also known to both of us that we can say whatever we want because we can say whatever we want. Right. <laughs> it's like well, I can say, and, and, and when you're in alone in the studio, you're alone in the studio. So either you want to believe that there are creatures that are making sound around you or not. The difference is, can you be a part of the reality while you're accepting that you're hearing voices but you don't see anyone around? That's crucial. Right. When you see, feel movement and motion around you, within you, next to you, above you, whatever it is, uh, do you think you can handle it and use it as your as an extra tool, extra deliciousness into the toolbox of yours, and but still keep maintain direct relationship with reality? Then you're a winner, because if we were to separate, let me ask you a question out, out of all this kind of long speech. What if I was to take everything away from you? I'll take your toolbox away from you. I'll take all the elements that makes you feel safe and <coughs> and you know. At ease with yourself, and you know that, that you're ready to go. So, so wh where are you going from there? I want, I want, I want you to describe to me the painting that will come to life with me taking so much away from you. And I'm saying it actually not in a challenging way, just as well. It, it, I mean, there's a reality to it. I mean, I stopped painting with oils, uh, which I love. That's my preference. But I stopped painting with oils a because uh, we had a baby in the house, and oil paints just are not a great thing to have in the house to breathe. Um, and I switched to acrylics. I remember, just as a side, um, I remember at BU when the people from, um, uh, what's the big uh, company that makes uh, acrylic paints? Benjamin Moore? No, I mean, no. You mean um, um, yeah, okay, anyway. They came, they came to the school and they said, and BU was teaching everybody with oil paints, and they came to school with uh, mm -hmm. with acrylic paints. And I remember his squeezing the paint out, and it came out of the tube, and there was a long string of paint. Liquitex. Yeah. That was the company. Yeah. And I remember the magenta was just coming out of the tube, and it wasn't 
going on the pallet, it was just like rubber. And it just, and everybody's looking at it and they're going, we're never going to paint with these this junk. Well, you know, what are we painting with today? We're painting with acrylics. Far better than what, what Liquitex had at that time. It was the beginning of Liquitex. Now Liquitex is a great paint, but it's not oil paints. Oil paints has something to it that there are colors that you can get. There are things that you can do with oil paints. There are things that you can do. Forget this phony turpentine stuff and phony all the stuff. If you're going to paint with oils, screw the environment, screw your health, screw everything. You get the real stuff. You get turpentine. You get the I know, real things. But I, to begin with, don't like this whole reality. What do you use? What do you use? This, this question that's been asked is so pathetic, man. Who cares, really? Who cares? You know what? A lot of people come to me and think that I work in oil. What does so that tell what? you? No, no, it's good, actually. So, I think it's great. So they think oil is better. So that means the acrylic that I use, the way I do it, and all the te other technique, makes it look as if it's oil without me trying even to do it. But I don't want to be a part of this discussion. This is energy draining factors. Right. Pure and simple. Right. Uh, so I, I want to tell you that actually in, in the early stages, I was panicking. So choosing the paint that I choose, chose as a house painter, uh, I knew about house painter, house paint. Uh, I, I didn't know the first thing. So I just decided I'm going to go every time I go to a, an art supply store, I'm going to buy the freaking cheapest thing I can get and lay my hand on. To answer your question, if you came into my studio and you took everything out except my brushes and my paints, I don't use a palette. I use paper, and I, you know, from printing days, I have tons of paper left, and it doesn't, the paints. But, that's, but, but phase two would be, you're not allowed to use seven colors that I'm going to tell you that you're not allowed to use them. Okay. And then third, third, um, um. I don't want to see m repetition more than twice. Like if you want to repeat something to cr to create like a like a, like a pattern, you can only create two of them. That means you can only if you want to do circles, you you can only do circles one after the other, two of them. That's it. That's fine. Say, so wait. So the the thing is, and then uh, you don't you cannot wait for drying time. You have to finish the painting. Right. Okay. So that's and we were taught never yep. never never. Never use black. That's a color that doesn't exist in our palette. We I know. make our own Who black. Who said that? Please tell me. I want to know. That's how we were taught. Okay. That's why when I started, people say, every painting of yours has black. But it's not black. It's the black I make. So, okay. Wh what am I supposed to do with this information? A lot came to me and say, oh, I, I noticed that you're squeezing the paint right direct straight out of the tube. So what? Because if they wanted to say, you know, so what? Screw you! You're you're you're, no, you're nobody because you can't that even mix your own paint, your own colors, that's whatever. That's absurd. <laughs> so I would always say, so what are you trying to tell me? Do you like the painting or you don't? Or you know what? I'm better off not even knowing. That's not the point. But I was panicking. It's I'll a meaningless conversation for somebody to tell you what paints you can use, what colors you can use. When I learned painting, the reason I went to BU is it was like an art guild. I mean, you know the process. I've told you hundreds of times of how we learned to paint. What the, You couldn't paint until you made your paint. You had to grind the pigments. It was a long, drawn-out process. But I'll tell you, when you finally got everything done and you tubed up all your colors and everything and you finally got your canvas on the, on the easel, which I happen to keep, um, there was a, se a sense of I'm literally at the very beginning of the painting process because I can't go back any further unless I had dug up some of the rocks and things that end up being ground in the, in the mortar and pestle. That's the only step I could have gone further back with. But we had to grind everything, linseed oil, a stone that crushes, and you make paint out of it. And... You know, that's as, as basic as you can get. So if you said to me you have to eliminate eight colors or nine colors, so what? So I work with what's left. It's not a challenge. The thing is, the parallel to is, in 1986, I was uh, taking poetry lessons from Steve Sedering. She's very well known. She's an artist, a playwright, a musician, uh, you name it, uh, a poet. Um, 
and she, when she accepted me, when she, when, when I, I enrolled into a, a workshop for poetry at the uh, D'Amico Institute, and they called me and they said that I'm the only one who enlisted, so they have to <laughs> cancel the uh, <laughs> workshop. So I said, "Who's who's running it?" She said, "This is Steve Sedevi. May I have her, you know, phone number?" They gave it to me. I called her and I said, "Listen, I I, wa I want to take poetry sessions, lessons, whatever." She said, "Come see me." We talked. I left her some of my writings. I saw her a week later, and she said, "Okay, I I I want to I want to teach you and all this, but here's a list of a dozen words that you cannot use unless." you have a full justification of why you want to use it. Right. And that it won't be just a smear of that greatness of the word that will do the job for you. You have to take me hand in hand into that realization before you use God and nature and eternity and time and speed, you know. So, so I said, so on one hand, I'm presenting her. What do you want from my 12 words that I'm in love yeah, with? Yeah, but you get in a No, inside, inside. That's the point. Yeah. No. And the other one was saying, uh, that's interesting. I think I can handle it. Then you go about to implement it, and you see that it's so difficult. But you always envision the fact that if she said that, that it turned out to be so difficult, I mean, she must have some kind of love for me, like like some kind of appreciation. She wants me to do well. She's also assuming, uh, correctly in this case, assuming that you can c still write with the elimination of those words. It's the same thing as painting without certain colors. Am I, am I going to lose anything? No, I'm going to adapt to the other colors and make those colors work for me. I may do a landscape and the sky's not blue. Maybe it's purple because you eliminated blue as one of my colors. It's still going to work. My clouds may not be white. They may be black or my form of black, because I don't use black. I make my black. So however you, actually, it's a really interesting concept now that I'm thinking about it. Um, and just as a side, you gave me a canvas for your show, and I am having a blast coming up with this new project for you. I think when you see the final thing, you're going to go. I'm oh. afraid to ask if you started it even. Oh, I'm it's, not. It's, it's, it's being done. <laughs> and and you're just going to look at it and you're going to say, <laughs> how the hell did you come up with that? It is so, because it's you, because it's your show, because it's me, I and just don't want to put the same thing <laughs> up again. So I'm doing something that is going to be. It's called your reputation is on totally the line. Totally <laughs> different. Your reputation is on the line, not I'm, mine. Listen, I'm not as good and as extensively experienced as you are to worry that I'm going to lose <laughs> anything. <laughs> you got some. Um, but <coughs> if, if Steve Sedering would have come to me today, and let's say we're starting the session today, and she's giving me the words. Let's start with the word God, okay? Um, it, this is not going to be tedious at all. Let's start with the word God, okay? Um, that power that lingers, Yahweh, that lingers, abruptively crowded. What's the next one? Eternity. Eternity, yeah? The long time of tamed speed. See, but there's a problem with that statement. Wait, wait, wait no, no, no. But wait, wait. This is okay. the poem. The poem is happening. Okay. What is the, what is the third word? Give, give it to me. The problem is... Give me a third the, word. The word. The third word? Yeah, the, out of time and... Life. Life, okay. Breath chases breath single handedly. What else? Soul. Ah. Okay. Um, Wind 
across the gra the glaciers. Huh? Good, huh? <laughs> okay. Okay, the glaciers. What 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 the uh... Chaos. Mm. Um surrounding within a speck of reintroduction. What else? Nuance. Bleak, yet remorse-free. Yeah, go ahead. Devastation. Mm. Above, yet the most formidable delight. What else? Let's go spirit, soul, even a neutral. Neutral. S a a see-through. Of some kind. Okay, what else? Time. We, s we said no, we okay. We used time. We used to say. Um, from... Before the eruption of middle eight, not much of a hugger. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It's okay. What was that last word? H hugging a hugger. Oh, hugger. A hugger. Okay. <laughs> Uh, wait, uh, don't, don't, don't uh, confuse me. Okay, go ahead. Love. Oh, my God. I was wondering how long it's a... Um, okay, so if I was saying that, I was wondering when we both will succumb, will... to each other's needs. Turbulence. Right? Round and round again and always. Bombast. Another one? Skip? You want to skip that one? Okay. Um, lethargic. Stutter. You son of an elated prime. What was st stud stutter stutter S T U D D E R T T S T S T U T T E R stutter. Oh, like oh what am stutters. I saying? Stutter. Okay, so got it, got it. The T other one is a guy T -T -E who's a stud. Got it. Yeah, you son of an, of an, of a. I hear. I wrote. Okay. Incomprehensible. Believing within a newly newly acquired 
uh, how do you say the acquire is a q u a a c q u i r e d i believe may not have a c in it i'm not sure okay got it <coughs> yeah and one and last and right, yeah one last one and yet the Uh, the height fits the climb. Okay. Incomprehensible. Second time around. You were chosen. to leave on your own behalf. Okay. Okay. Now, <coughs> if you so, can do I'm me a favor, if you have those words in your phone and you can print them out and email them to you, next time I come on the show, I'll bring you a poem with every one of those words in it. Yeah, of course. Of course, okay. definitely. But the thing is that uh, do, 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 do you get the grip of the situation here? I now, what I do, what I do nowadays, thanks to that, uh, resenting my resentments, denying my resentments, feeling comfortable with the fact that she gave me a gift, half of which she knew what it was and half of which she didn't even know. Right. And she would be would have been very happy to see how I completed her contribution, I matched it uh, for my own sake because she came from a, that clean place where you don't get to see much, really. Um, so it goes to art also. When I'm in front of the canvas, I, I know I know what I'm doing when and I'm, what I'm about to do and where I'm going only because I'm so eager to get to the next stage all the time because I got such a perfect handle on the situation and and I'm happy enough to to keep it going. That it's almost like trying to fight. Also being bored, you can easily be bored. You know, if you have the talent and you kind of achieve achieve things at ease. At some point, it just feels well like that's you. Not, that's not true. Even even if it's great and 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 unique and genius, it's still a repetition. But then you learn to to respect it and to to appreciate that kind of experience and capabilities. And abilities, you know what I mean, uh, and that's that's a good place to be. And I think I'm at that stage. I crossed it and achieved it and arrived there not too long ago. And now I'm exploring the early stages of of the fourth step. You know what I mean? Right. There's something. Um, yesterday was a very interesting day in that three things occurred, and I'll go. Uh, th my theory is there's no such thing as coincidence. So I'm going to deal in three different things. Three things happened yesterday. Uh, Lenore was cooking a steak in the oven, and we had, a, we had an oven fire. So she pulled the, the tray out with the steak, put the flames out, put the steak back in, caught fire again, pulled the steak out, and I said, I think we're done cooking the steak. <laughs> I don't care how rare it is. I just want the house to be here when we're finished eating. <laughs> So it turned out that it was okay and there wasn't any problem with it. Um, Did you examine it methodically? And I, I looked to see, you know, is the fire still burning somewhere up in the house? <laughs> yes. You know, that kind of thing. That you don't know. So, but then we went inside to eat, turn on the TV, and immediately a scene comes on on Blue Bloods where the old man, the, the uh, police uh, commissioner's father, is cooking and there's a fire <laughs> and the kitchen is filled with smoke and there are flames all over the place and i said to lenora i said you see there's no such thing as coincidence and two more things happened like that that night but exactly like that something we did something turned on the tv and there was exactly the same thing so it was in threes yeah and Part of life um, is that we we have to question 
there's no answer to it. We have to question our reality. You know, there's, there are all kinds of theories out there. Um, the more they discover about deep space, there's no, there was never a Big Bang. That's gone. Our lives are changing so fast. Um, they have now found, uh, they thought human civilization went back 25,000 years, and it went back 50,000 years, and they found something else that was 100,000 years. Now they're back to 500,000 years. They're back to a million years. I mean, it constantly changes. So at the time, and I'll tie this in with what happened last weekend, at the time that electricity became popular, we had two people who were developing electricity, Edison and Tesla. And Edison was a way to make money for people very quickly, the way Rockefeller did with certain things, whether it was coal or oil or whatever it was, made his fortune doing that. So everybody went with Edison because you had to buy cable, you had to put up poles, there was all kinds of ways of doing it. Tesla's process was, if they'd gone with it and perfected it, was sending electricity through the air, no, no cables, no poles, no anything. And everybody poo-pooed it, they said they weren't gonna, there was no money to make in it, that was the problem. Well, guess what? By 2025, a few years from now, and I just read it the other day, there are going to be four, 12 or 14 drones at an altitude of 60,000 feet. They're going to be getting electricity beamed up to them from the ground, flying the plane. Tesla's theory. And they're finally implementing it. And if that step one works, it's conceivable that within the very near future, there will not be a plane taking off, whether it's a jumbo jet or whatever it is, that's not flying on electricity. Unless some French drunk pulls <laughs> the, As you pulls said, the... unless, you know, hey, monsieur, did you put the plug in? No. Oh, I forgot the plug. <laughs> We're going to crash. And of course, he's going to crash in his backyard, you know. <laughs> but, uh, but it was so rewarding to see that somebody like Nikola Tesla is finally being proven right. His theories were solid. His theories worked and they are working, and they're finally getting to it. That was just one example. Last weekend, I was at a meeting, and there was a person there who had a degree in a certain form of science who was speaking about how wonderful the wind turbines were, how great fracking was, and there was something else that I remember what it was. And me being me, uh, at the end of his discussion, I raised my hand. And I said, Why did you even raise your hand? Why I said, you <laughs> because I'm me. You know me. Um, I said, I really appreciate what you said, except you're completely wrong. None of what you said is either accurate, factual, or correct. And then I got a sermon afterwards about how wrong I was about everything. And I went home, and I've done my research. I was right. He's wrong about everything. So I'm going to try and make an effort politely to go back to the same group that thought he was wonderful and that I was totally wrong and explain to them the facts, the real facts, calmly, concisely, as to all these things that he thinks are so wonderful. And I'm doing it for the sole reason that I was brought up that way. I don't talk about something and make a statement unless I know my facts. And it brought up the memory of when I was in high school, my grade in English was circled 65. To this day, I don't know what a noun or a verb or a pronoun, I have no idea what that means. But my grade in creative writing was A+. Love it. Why a guidance counselor in that school didn't look at my grades and go, Wait a minute, he's f just about barely passing English, but in creative writing, he's, he's writing A+. these great stories. There's nothing misspelled. There's nothing grammatically wrong. How's he doing this? One is not consistent with the other. The you school ask let how, me down. How do they not pick up on the significance of it? They didn't. So that's the question to be asked. No, how you do? How you doing it? It's known. You're doing it because you're talented. Because I, it's a part of who it you are. A my parents spoke properly. B, I read everything in the Bryant Library 
from starting on one shelf, going through the every shelf that I get my hands on. And if you read, there were no computers and there were no phones or oh, anything yeah. like that. Oh, yeah. But if you read the right books that are written properly, you pick up language, you pick up spelling, you pick up grammar. To this day, if you said pick out the verb, I don't know what the verb is. I don't care. But can I write something? <laughs> I can write it perfectly. I, I really admire your, your honesty. And, you know, because I, ga I got to tell you, I don't know writing. either. But anyway, yes, well, I know what I need to know. And I know enough to say that actually, you know, uh, the other day I had a guest here. We talked about the fact that, you know, why I, I always ask why, you, let's say you're going to, um, you're going to, a, to, an, to an art school, whatever, whatever some college, whatever. You you take the, the the test and this and that and then you have like an interview, and then um, I don't know maybe the instructor or the one in charge will tell you listen I I don't really see much of a future for you <laughs> 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 like yeah, like you like you're smart you this and that but I don't think you get what it takes really and it would be in a nice way whatever you know and so I think maybe you should try again next year or maybe you should venture into different conversations instead of telling him the truth and the truth is listen you're really good. You're really, really good. But we got 100 spots, and you weren't one of those 100s right. because there were like 1,300 applicants. So I suggest that don't stop working, doing what you're doing, come see us next year again. Right. That's all there is to it. What is it going to cost you? Now, you know what? In my boarding school, I was known because we had like immigrants uh, that came to Israel in the 70s from like 50 countries. So there were like 10 languages spoken in my boarding school. So I picked up Russian. I was very talented. And everybody knew about me. <coughs> they knew about Chaim Israhi. He can speak Russian. Right. So the English teacher that was educated in American English um, was educated in in the, in the, in the, in the uh, University of Moscow came to see me, and I knew him because he was the the husband of the uh, business teacher, whatever, whatever stuff like that. So he starts talking to me. He came and he tricked me, and he, sp he got into a conversation in Russian. And I sp and I answered. So. He he got into this stupid, reckless, irresponsible discussion with me, saying, why do you want to pick up Russian? I said, I'm not picking it up. I'm just surrounded by them. All of my friends are Russian. And you're learning. I'm learning and all this. And it's so, great. So do you, you know that if you grow up and all this, they will always prefer someone who is Russian that can speak. To it? They will always prefer the Russian that speaks Hebrew and English rather than just the Hebrew. American that speaks Russian and Hebrew or the a Jew Jewish Israeli guy that speaks uh, that speaks Russian and uh, that speaks English and in, uh, in, uh, Russian. So I turned to him and I said, "What's your point? Why are you harassing me?" <laughs> like uh, you should say, "Oh, listen, very impressive. You sound good, great." You know, anyway, <coughs> it's irrelevant that somebody would would bring up the fact that you're capable of discussing. I mean, I remember being in Amsterdam, and the street vendors who were selling pickled herring spoke seven or eight languages. I know, but then it, there wasn't that much to be done except uh, with languages, uh, except the translation. It's so it's not like today. And I only, but it, it's, it's, it's the concept that I was trying to stress. You know, you're going to ask, I, I went to, uh, I took the course for, uh, um, uh, for, um, uh, 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 Mechanical dentistry, you know, what do you call it? Um, uh, yeah, I know what you mean. Uh, where uh, they clean your teeth. Uh, no, 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 where uh, they make the teeth and make the... Oh, okay, I know what you mean. They, whatever. So the, when I was in my 20s after the army, it was a great profession to get into. Right. So my friend and I took the course, and both to both of us, he, in the interview, he said, listen, you're straight A, it's perfect, all the tests, but I don't see you sitting in a small corner in a small room. Right, making teeth. And, and, and shaving. <laughs> and right. I said... I, but what does that have to do with you? Right. He said, I'm doing you a favor. Go. Hey, look, when I was in high school, and everybody at that time, this is um, 59, 60, 61, you start taking tests with the guidance council to see what you're qualified for. Now, I had already been to, I'd already studied with Lily Rona, who had lived with Albert Einstein, and I've told you the story. And I came across the picture the other day, and I looked up Lily Rona. And it shows her with all these incredible sculptures of Einstein. I mean, just magnificent. And I was seven years old when I started. And just so your audience knows, 
She was from Romania. She lived with Einstein for a fairly long period of time. I'm seven years old. When you see the sculpture that I'm doing, you'll go, how did somebody seven years old, seven years old do this? And she would say, let me tell you about <laughs> Albert. <laughs> and, you know, I'm a little kid, but she understood basically the concept of Einstein's theory of relativity, <laughs> teaching it to a seven-year-old kid. Not that I learned all of it, certainly wasn't able to, but it triggered my imagination that from that point on, those kind of things in science, and that goes back to the meeting last weekend when this guy with the degree and whatever it was is stating all the wrong things. And when I spoke to him, he said to me, well, how do you know this? And I said to him, it's really simple. I don't talk unless I know my facts. I don't talk off the top of my head. I don't make this stuff up. When I come back... But why embarrass him? Let him be. I'm not going to embarrass him. No. I don't want to embarrass him no. in any way. And I want to handle it very politely. And I don't want to put him down I want or you to else. start by saying this, and I appreciate your effort here. Absolutely. And, and I cannot dismiss every word that you're saying. It's just that some corrections are required. There are, so I you can, you can say, really be kind of generous with him. I want to say I, run, I work on the principle of shoe sides to everything. And the people listening can then make their own decision, which side they, they choose or what they think is right or wrong. But they're entitled to know that there are two sides to every story. And when I started finding out the actual facts, it's astounding. I cannot find, and if anybody's listening in, I would like to know, Every article on the wind turbines that's going in says that they are going to generate enough power for 70,000 homes. And nowhere can you find where those 70,000 homes are. No place. It doesn't say the Hamptons. It doesn't say Suffolk. It doesn't say Nassau. It doesn't tell you where. Now, the fact is that the company that's building the turbines hasn't put up the turbines yet. They're supposed to be running by the end of this year. That means November, December. They're not even built. And the cost has gone up a billion dollars. Who do you think is going to absorb that cost? Us. You got it. Two companies that built the turbines off of Massachusetts have already walked away from the projects. They're losing money. And how many gallons of motor oil, the same thing that goes into your car goes into each turbine. Now, we're trying to get away from petroleum. That's the whole concept of wind turbines. 320 to 400 gallons of motor oil goes into each turbine, and it has to be changed every year. What are they doing with that used motor oil? Where's it going? Yeah, but anyway, uh, and it goes I, on and on. Let's just say, are on. you surprised? Am I surprised? No, no, I, I you're not surprised because but we're, I wanted, we're constantly because we have five more minutes. I wanted to mention we're sitting here with Steve Rum on uh, October nineteenth, year two thousand twenty-three, on Tuesday afternoon here with the Hello Hello Show. And my name is Chaim Mizrahi, and why don't you indulge me in reading what you just uh, what you just helped me write, and we can uh, because I'm, we can sit here forever and discuss our things. I just if you send me. Well, next time we get together, if you send me those words, I'll come back with a poem for you. And I am really looking forward to seeing your face when I bring my... But you know what? I didn't mention any of the words here that you gave me. You put it into... You made sentences with those words as the inspiration. Inspiration, the exactly. Okay. That power that lingers abruptly... That lingers, that lingers abrupt, that power that lingers abruptly crowded the long time of tamed speed, breath chases breath, single-handedly wind across the glaciers, surrounding within a speck of reintroduction, bleak. We could have a poetry runoff. Yet remorse. And I will say to you, my travels and travails of my life have inspired me to take alternate courses, somewhat divergent from what I thought would be happening. The roads ahead of me, covered in mist, covered in fog, covered in glaring sunlight, offered choices I was incapable of at that time. Im impeccable. 
I can impressive. Keep going. Yeah, yeah. Fine. I, I can do that the same. But this is our baby. But that's, this is so how we do it. But wait, here. I'm almost but done. Th- but Surrounding within a speck of reintroduction bleak, yet remorse free, above, and yet most formidable delight see through of some kind from from before the eruption of middle, not much of a of of a hugger. And then I need the and then I need to reply to it, encompassed in a sphere which makes me devoid of all life surrounding me, able to look out but not in. What do I see? When Darkness we both and light. Yes. And when we both go on forever. When we both will uh, succumb to each other's needs round and round again and always stutter you son of an elated prime believing within a newly acquired and yet the light fits the climb second time around you were chosen to live and to live and to live on your own behalf and he thrust his thoughts into my head until he reached the wall of concrete where the thoughts bounced back into his mind. Yes, and without further delay, he saw the cloud, and the cloud meant so much can to him. Can you imagine? Dissipating into the thin huh? air. But guess what? Suddenly he hears can Steve Rahm's voice whispering behind him, and it ruined everything. <laughs> <laughs> can you imagine somebody sitting in that chair going, what the hell are they talking yeah, about? That's and I don't know how to do that. <laughs> well, yeah, obviously. Their comment would be, what? Listen, we're both on the same uh, wave. Uh, we have fun. Uh, thing. Yeah, absolutely. And I hope the audience that's out there, and there is an audience out there, understands this, what goes on between us. Yes. Becomes and part of it and enjoys it. This is the tip it. of the iceberg. Oh, that's so much. No we're going to be here tomorrow as much as we were here yesterday and as much as we're here this afternoon of Thursday afternoon, October 19th, year 2023. And my name is Haim Mizrahi here with the Hello, Hello Show. And I apologize. Um, uh, I apologize for having Steve Rummy. <laughs> Thank you, Steve. Did you see my, how red my eyes? <laughs> he punched me to get me here. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, uh, uh, Steve. Uh, keep up the good spirits. Don't forget we have the ongoing uh, group archer here at LTV with uh, uh, Andrew Bailey, with um, Dorothy Koppelman. Uh, Abby Abrams and myself. And, and my love to Lenore. You got it. Lenore, we love you. All the best. Keep up the good spirits.